So today and next time we're going to talk about how God strengthens your faith, but specifically today we're going to talk about trouble. Trouble in our lives and how God uses it. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 6, Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials or trouble. And verse 7, he says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So here, as I told you the last time we were together in Peter, Peter gives us five points of contact to rediscover the joy of our salvation. And it comes from a confidence in five things that he reveals to us in this passage. One is our inheritance. And we talked about that last time, that where you look in life is critical and what you anticipate in life is critical. Secondly, he deals with our trials and that our confidence in our trials to pr help produce joy and deeper faith becomes a source of joy to us. And then our honor, he talks about, and our fellowship and our deliverance, all of that is in this passage. Now today I want to focus on simply the second thought, which is in verse 6, and that is our trial and how trouble contributes to our well-being as Christians. In verse 6 he says, In this you greatly rejoice. Here he is talking about a rejoicing that is above and beyond normal rejoicing related to circumstances in life. It is a spiritual rejoicing. He says, You greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. I love to take a nice verse like that that God puts in the Bible. I'm always amazed at how much truth he can compact into such a short space. Here in this one verse, there are basically five things that Peter tells us about trouble. And I want to take you through those five things today. And I want to illustrate them with illustrations from real life. Perhaps in this sense, this study is more devotional than anything else, but I do pray it will be an encouragement to you. We're going to, we're going to spend time talking about how God tests our faith, and we'll go on and do that next time. For this time, we're talking about how we are tested by trouble, and I want to give you five things one at a time. But before I do that, Job 5 says that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. I don't know if you've ever taken a hammer and hit iron or anything like that and watched the sparks fly up, but just as sparks fly upward, so man is born to trouble. There is not a one among you, myself included, all of us, have had our fair share of trouble in this life. It starts very early, you know. I, even in my daughter Diana's life, at the age of two years, she had open heart surgery. She began her life with open heart surgery, in essence. About the time you're two, you begin to understand things and you're able to talk a little bit and run around. And she started her life with open heart surgery. Trouble. We're born to it. We all face it. We all go through it. So let me give you the first thought here that Peter introduces to us about trouble. And that is that trouble doesn't last. Trouble doesn't last. He says here that in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Notice he says, now for a little while. One of the things that has become more and more important to me to realize in my life is that I go through a lot of trouble. And that as you grow as a Christian and you mature as a Christian, it is a great day when you finally realize you will always have trouble. And you get past the thing of moaning and groaning and griping and complaining over all the trouble that comes your way. And you begin to understand that God uses it in a very intense way in your life. And one great thing to know about trouble is this, it doesn't last. In that sense, it will not always be there in your life because 
this life will soon be passed and heaven's going to last forever and there's not going to be any trouble in heaven. John Newton used to say, a man who wrote Amazing Grace, he had so much trouble in his life. He used to say that the road is not to be complained of that we are on since it leads to such a heavenly home. This trouble isn't going to last. Isaac Watts, so gifted in writing words and prose and hymns, he put it this way. He said, there is a land of pure delight where saints immortal reign. Infinite day excludes the night and pleasures banish pain. The day will come when your trouble will be over forever. So as your trouble hits you in life, as you're facing them right now, please understand this. Trouble isn't always going to last. It seems like it will when you're in it, but it isn't always going to be there. Let me take you to a second thought. In the same verse here, the second thing is that trouble serves a purpose in your life. 1 Peter 1.6 says, If need be, if need be, you are grieved by various trials. You see, from God's point of view, you need to go through many of the things that he allows in your life. You say, well, what purpose does trouble serve in my life? Well, there's a lot of things it does for you. For example, it humbles you. And some of you need a good deal more humbling than you think. One of the biggest things about pride is that it blinds you as to how proud you really are. God uses trouble to humble you. That is a good thing. He uses trouble to wean us from worldly things because when trouble hits, we generally hit our knees, especially if it's been a long time since we've been on our knees. He uses trouble to help us look toward heaven because we long for a better life. He uses trouble to reveal to us what we really love, what really matters to us. He uses trouble to teach us, and as we are taught and comforted, we are able to teach and encourage and comfort others, as Paul says. He uses trouble to chasten us for our sin. And if you're in big trouble night right now, maybe you're in big sin, and God wants you to think about it and turn from it. He uses trouble to develop character. And all of those are good things. That is a good purpose that God uses trouble for. For example, turn in your Bible just to the right to 1 Peter chapter 5 to verse 10 with me. And here Peter says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect and establish and notice, strengthen and settle you. Trouble is used by God to really strengthen you. You don't grow in strength in the easy times. You grow in strength in the difficult times. You could compare it to a lap dog and a wolf. Some of you like lap dogs. Dogs, you have them. They sit on your lap and their tongue sticks halfway out when they're doing nothing. I've seen them. And they're cute little things. You know that little... I don't know why lap dogs do that, but they do it. They just sit on your lap and with their tongue halfway out. Little poodles especially do that. And they're cute. But you know, lap dogs are not strong dogs. If you take something in the similar family to go out into the woods and find a wolf, a wolf has a very tough life. He doesn't sit on somebody's lap. He has to run through the woods. He has to hunt down his food. He has to fight hard to stay alive. And as a result, a wolf is a very, very strong creature. And a lap dog is a very weak little creature. Trouble brings strength. The sooner you realize that, the better. And you'll quit cowering when it comes and you'll face it boldly and you'll face it like a man or a real woman and quit wimping out in the Christian life. And I'm not saying you're all wimps, but I am saying this in a roundabout way. Think about our society today. It's turning out the wimpiest generation of people I think who've ever lived on the face of the earth. Pampered, baby wimps. No values whatsoever, can't deal with anything with life, just as soon kill you as look at you, bail out on every responsibility in life, no loyalty, no devotion, no family ties. But you see, we are in the family of God now. We have different standards, we have a purpose, and we are to be strengthened. 
among all the wimpiness and mushiness of our society, we're to stand as those that have strength. And God uses trouble to bring strength in our life. It has a great purpose. So trouble isn't going to last. Trouble has a purpose. Let me take it to a third thought. Trouble brings pain. Trouble brings pain. In 1 Peter 1, 6, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been noticed. What does it say? Grieved. That's pain. Trouble brings pain. That would include mental anguish. That would include sadness, disappointment, physical pain. And I have learned along the way that pain has a big part in changing you. You know why? For one thing, pain forces you to ask questions. Pain forces you to get alert and think about your situation and ask questions. And asking questions is good. I have found that, and many of you I think have found this, that sickness brings pain and that often bodily pain is a great tool of God in your own sanctification for many reasons. But I think that sickness is often a messenger to call us to meet with God. In the midst of our schedule, totally out there, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the life I love. Sickness hits. Thrown on your back. And there you meet with God. Often sickness is God's messenger to call us to meet with Him. And I've learned something else. You know, I have a lot of commentaries in my library. Some of them I don't even know that I have there. I have a lot of them in there. And I love to read commentaries. I love to read what God has shown the great saints of the past. And I love to compare my own insights with those of men that are so anointed and greater giants than I will ever be. I love commentaries, but I've noticed something. I've noticed that there is no commentary that opens up the Bible to me like sickness and sorrow. And I think maybe you're finding that in your life to be true as well. There is no commentary that opens up the Bible to you like pain, sickness, and sorrow. Because it drives you to the scriptures where you're looking for answers. And in that mode and in that frame of mind and heart, you find them at the hand of God. C.S. Lewis used to say that God whispers to us in our pleasures. God speaks in our consciences. But God shouts in our pains. He used to say that pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I like that. Not because I like pain, because I think, but because I think it's very insightful. And C.S. Lewis had his share of pain. You know, he lived out his life, for most of his life, as a bachelor. Finally, he met this woman named Joy. And they fell in love, and this was very late in his life. She brought, according even to her name, so much joy to his life. But it was so very brief, because she contracted cancer... And they were married only a couple of years, tops, and she was dead and gone. And she was suddenly taken from him. He knew pain in his life. You have known pain. I have known pain. But I think we need to all agree that pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And we live in a world today that is deaf to the voice of God. Why does God allow all this pain? That's why. Charles Spurgeon was a man who knew so much pain. He was dead by the time he was 57. He lived in pain, often six months out of the pulpit at a time with sicknesses. And he said this. He said, I owe everything to the furnace and the hammer. I have made no progress in heavenly learning except when I have been chastened by the great schoolmaster. The best piece of furniture in my house has been the cross. My greatest enricher has been personal pain. And for that, I desire to thank God. He went on to say this. He said, I can truly say of everything I have ever tasted in the world of God's mercy, and my path has been remarkably strewn with divine loving kindness. He says, I feel more grateful to God for the bodily pain I have suffered and for all the trials I have endured of different sorts than I do for anything else except the gift of His dear Son. 
I am sure that I have derived more benefit, permanent strength, growth, growth in grace, and every precious thing from the furnace of affliction that I have ever derived from prosperity. That, those are the words of a mature man. You wonder why Spurgeon's sermons, I have over 3,000 of them on my bookshelf, you wonder why they remain to this day. I don't know a pastor who's into the Word that doesn't read Spurgeon. Now, all the ones that aren't into the Word probably don't even know who he is, and many of them that I know, they don't know who he is. They don't know who Dwight Moody is, and they don't know who R.A. Torrey is, and they don't know who any of these men of God are, really. But if you're into the Word, you read Spurgeon. Why? Because his words come down to us alive to this day. And yet, here is a man, you study his life, he lived in so much pain. His wife was bound to a wheelchair. She had her share of pain, Susanna. And she developed a ministry of sending books and materials out to pastors all over the world who didn't have anything. Rather than being bitter in her pain, she took advantage of her situation to focus on those that were out there that had less than her, and she went on to grow because of it. Sometimes in a mystery of God's providence, I think that the most painful thing that happens to us is the thing we need most. Have you come to realize that? Maybe you're there now. Maybe you're shaking your fist at God in your trials. Maybe you're shouting why and even perhaps almost cursing God in your heart because you don't understand your pain. Let me say this to you. All you're manifesting is your own immaturity, your own ignorance of a God of love who is so much bigger than you ever dreamed him to be that if you would open your eyes and be patient and let time tell all, you will look back to thank him for the painful things that have come your way, even if it's now the greatest thing that has ever hit you. In 1857, at the outbreak of the Sepoy Rebellion in India, the Hindus attempted to slaughter as many Englishmen as they could, especially the officers and their families. One such officer and his wife had gone to a neighboring town not knowing that there was any danger threatening. They left their little daughter at home in the care of a native nurse of whom the girl was very fond. When the uprising began, Ellen was in mortal danger, that's the little girl, in spite of her tender years, for she had a white skin and was an officer's child. But her father's countrymen did not forget her nor forsake her. One of them galloped to her home and snatched her from the dark-skinned nurse and remounted his horse, holding little Ellen before him. By this time, shouting and frenzied people filled the street and they attempted to stop the horse and kill both the rider and the child. But the man drew his saber and he fought them every foot of the way, all the time holding the child firmly in his arms. Naturally, she was exceedingly frightened by all the noise and confusion. She kicked and she struggled and she cried. Several times she almost slipped from his arms. This multiplied the difficulties of his task enormously. But at last he won through and after a long hard ride delivered his little charge safely to her mother. Who can picture the frantic joy of the parents to have their little one safe with them at such a time? Their gratitude knew no bounds, but it was entirely different as far as their daughter was concerned. She felt a deep resentment to her rescuer. He had held her so roughly. He had shaken her so much while riding. He had refused to let her go back to her beloved nurse. How could such a rude friend, a rude man, be considered a friend and a benefactor? Under no circumstances could she be induced to kiss him or even thank him at that time. Now, what was beyond the understanding of that child should be very clear and plain to you and I. As Ellen grew older, she must have often been ashamed of her childish ignorance for failing to recognize that the officer risked his life for the sake of her safety and that the bumps and jolts she received during the wild ride were unavoidable factors in affecting her rescue. But at the time, she judged only by outward appearances and actually believed that the rider was mean to her and angry with her. Let me ask you a, a very pointed question today. Do you believe that God is mean to you right now in your life? Do you believe that God is angry with you and he's mean with you and he handles you roughly because he doesn't love you? 
if that's what you believe about God, then you understand so little of him. And you must come to realize and embrace this truth that God uses pain in your life. And that sometimes the most painful things that you can possibly go through are the very most important things that you need in your life at that time. And the sooner you quit fighting against them, the better. Because God can get on with doing in the depths of the inward recesses of your soul that loving and gracious work that he longs to do in you.